you are live. Hey guys, this is Andy Shalef. This is Bambos Charles Dimitriou. You didn't say Bam. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Sometimes I want to be for more formal. Sometimes I want to be less formal. So, Today's a more formal day, actually. Yeah. Today we have uh, Jan Six on, and we're going to spend the hour talking with him about discovering a Rembrandt and all the things that came into that into being yeah. on a wonderful, wonderful chaos. chaos. So we've got a fun show, and it's fun for one very important reason. It's the first show Bombos has ever done research for. <laughs> so every time we do a show, Bombos, like he, he kind of half, you half give me shit because you're like, Andy, you know, you think too much or, you know, you, you, you ask these, these heady questions. Yeah. So I decided to uh, become heady today. And so now he became heady. I love he's a, he's converted into being heady. And what caused you to actually do that? Because this is a new, a new step for you. Uh, I, I guess I want to be more proactive with our guests. Okay. And, and normally I'm really tuning in and wanting to go deep and really find out um, more intimate questions, uh -huh. like more emotional. Like, for example, what keeps you up at night? Yeah. Like, uh, so really getting to know the person. Uh -huh. And you really just go straight for the meat, like... Uh, now tell me, what's it like being da 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 da? <laughs> <laughs> and because you've done the research and you have all these questions, uh -huh. it's like it doesn't even give me a, it doesn't even give a chance to jump for, in for for fucking breath. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're gonna be like, I'm gonna get my questions in. Today. I, I'm so gonna push you out of this. <laughs> I love it. No, okay. Know, so... And actually, I'm really learning from you. Oh, thank yeah. you. Well, I'm learning from you as well. I noticed that you tend to go deeper and I'll sort of stay and, and we'll kind of balance one another in that, in that dynamic, yeah. which is sweet. Um, so Jan, I've known Jan for a few years now. I met him through my contact with David Jacobs and David uh, is obviously a dear friend to us both. He helped us acquire a very special painting, right? Another, uh, I, I don't know what we call it, a masterwork, but it's certainly something that's very nice. Yeah. A Cornelis Trost. And, uh, and uh, so, and through that contact with Jan, we just had, you know, nice contact and I didn't trust to invite him on the show until we got to a level of professionalism where I didn't feel like we would embarrass him and ourselves. Nice. So that says a lot to finally get to a moment like that. Right. I, I wonder how he feels about you saying that. Like, <laughs> maybe it's like, treat me like a human, Andy. Jesus. What do you mean? No, I mean, listen, the, the, the funny thing is, is that everyone who comes on, they, everyone's got some sort of image to maintain. Yeah. How bad is it if you go to somewhere and they just, I mean, it is, you know, I, I gave up on it a long time ago. But what I'd love to do is before we jump on with Jan, what's kind of cool is that not only is is the story of Jan interesting, but at this moment, it's even more interesting because of the fact that he did discover this uh, this Rembrandt. Yeah. And uh, and 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 I only became more recently aware of the fact that that was made into a, a film. And, and I haven't fun. seen the film, but I, 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 uh, I know that it exists. Let's put it that way. And um, and so what I'd love to do is I'd love to play the preview of that just before we start as a segue into introducing him on. And, and, and it's and two minutes. It's a two minute film. It's guys. a two minute trailer. trailer. So we'll do that. We'll just add it and play it. And here you go. Enjoy the trailer. Well, I've known dozens of artists and I would have really liked to meet Hong Kong. I didn't imagine that I would ever own a painting by Rembrandt. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to suggest that we have a cup of coffee. Oh my god, this is good. This is echt goed. Stond gewoon oog in oog met Rembrandt. How does he do it? Chuk, chuk, chuk. Rembrandt was niet gestoord. Die heeft het expres naar buiten laten lopen. Every time I went to bed, I had Madame on the right and Monsieur on the left. <laughs> Als de Rembrandts in deze categorie op de markt komen, betekent dat actie. Nous aussi, on voulait les deux peintures. Leggen de Fransen dus ineens 80 miljoen op tafel. Het diplomatieke rel. Nou en? Nou en? Laat maar komen, joh. He lets himself go. A free spirit, in fact. I completely, completely relate to the obsession. Maar dat je echt iets ontdekt uit het niets. You've got one shot. Dat is zo fantastisch. 
We hebben het gekocht. 120. Dat is een goeie, hè? Nee, dat is helemaal geen remote. I really don't get this. It's a deep emotional. Het gaat er uiteindelijk om geld. I'm going to launch the raid on Rembrandt. List en bedrog in de kunstwereld over een nieuw ontdekte Rembrandt. Een bedrieger. Ik had een investeerder die tot miljoenen ging. It's a constant challenge being able to hold and carry. Rembrandt held and carried this. Trust me. Alles of niets. Dit is van Rembrandt. Absoluut. Hoi. I went up to the painting, I took it by both sides of the frame, and I kissed her on the lips. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to say, I've seen this trailer now a few times, and I find it exciting each time I watch it, because the music sort of makes it like I'm going to join into a murder mystery or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, And, and I can feel the emotions, like... Yeah. All these people that are presented really emotional and passionate about yeah. these paintings. And you kind of have the idea that it's sort of, they take a subject that could be considered, uh, you know, dispassionate, not particularly interesting. Yeah. And then say, add the twist to it, which actually creates the intrigue, of course, which makes for an interesting film. So without further ado, why don't we bring him on? And there he is, Mr. Jan Six. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> nice to Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you for dressing up for this interview. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for shaving. <laughs> uh, he, he asked me if it was okay early. And I said, please, you really think I'm going to dress up? He knows me long enough to know that basically it's hard for me to even get out of a pair of sweatpants in the morning nowadays. Well, at least your sweaters are changing. Yeah, the sweaters are getting better. So, Jan, thank you for actually joining us. This is sure. cool. Sure. Hmm. I had like 20 questions I was going to ask him. And now that Bambos has done so much work, I almost want Bambos to lead today and sort of sort of let his intrigue guide him. Like, hello. Hi. <laughs> so when I was researching about you and the Rembrandts, actually it's two Rembrandts, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. And that's a different question. But the, my curiosity got in the history of, the net of Amsterdam. I mean, the Nazis were here and they were confiscating a lot of artwork. Hmm. Sure. Like, how did that impact uh, your uh, your building with the artworks? My personal building with the artworks? Yeah. Well, um, uh, it's a funny question because it's the first yeah. time anyone ever asked me. Um, well, I didn't, I, 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 you know, I'm born long after the war. So yeah. directly, there's no, there's no relation. But I think that with every painting you try to research, there's always this question, what happened to the painting during the war? Yeah. For these two discoveries, because I think we're focusing on these two paintings, one painting came from a private English collection since the 18th century, so there was no issue whatsoever. And the other painting actually came from Germany. So we did think about that. And what you then do is you go through every database conceivable with any information about looted art, uh yeah you, you you do due diligence try to uncover whatever there is to find and the outcome was there was nothing mm. and now the picture has been in the public domain for you know maybe two three years two years and nothing turned up so you know you never know but i'm fairly confident that nothing happened it probably just hung somewhere in a hallway during the war mm. uh, there's no story there Yeah. I've got I, I got I've got intrigue questions going b back deeper. Go on, <laughs> go on, Mr. Deep. So, like, I want to sort of understand. So, when you were a kid, yeah, were you living in the house that had all these paintings around you? Is it like you woke up and you just saw them on the walls? Well, no, my my room, the room that I you know I called my own room, okay, on the on the lower floor. So the building. The building I grew up has several floors, and on the lowest floor we lived. Okay. Mm. And there were very few paintings, no Rembrandts, just simple. But were you like, did you kind of consider upstairs to be separate from the lower floor? There was like this thing above think, my head that. Yeah, I think practically, I think my parents decided that was a good thing because if you know, if we had 
personal guests or friends coming over that you didn't have to go through all the history and all the paintings. Mm. So it wasn't like waking up and, and, and looking into the eyes of Rembrandt. That, 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 <laughs> that never happened. No. It was very close by. So if I wanted, I could always walk upstairs. Yeah, I don't know if you're aware of this because in the research, you know that the picture of Jan VI the first is is hanging in the, yeah, the yeah, house. Yeah. So then the question is like, at what age do you then realize, wow, there I've got this thing in the world that's kind of known that's just hanging in our in our home? Like what age did that that become uh, apparent? I think uh, you know, early adolescence. I mean it's it when you grow up, you don't really think about it. Because in a way, it's normal, but it's the outside world that responds to it. So sure. usually the reaction of the outside world makes you stop and think. And then you see in the reactions of others what's going on. So I don't know, maybe 15, 16. And, and, and so and, and you don't equate it with like a moment, like a story, like, oh, yeah, there was this one time someone no. No. said I mean, something. Over the years, uh, funny moments happened. I mean, you know, there are a few pictures that are quite iconic. So sometimes somebody would visit the house and you would walk into a room and they would look at the picture and say, oh, wow, why would you have a copy hanging on that on the wall? Uh, realizing that's actually possible, that that's the original. Yeah. That's funny. And then you, wow. you realize, oh, wow, yeah, you know, this is a bit bizarre. Yeah. yeah. When you say visitor, are they even aware that you're young? Yeah, or, sure. Okay, so they don't think yeah. you're a tour guide. No, no, no. Usually, I'm, <laughs> hello, I'm young. <laughs> you know what I found really interesting when I was thinking about this interview was that, like, how many people can go back in their own lineage and actually count back generation? Like, I know that I've got three generations. And I knew they're Russian Jews. Like, that's as far as I go. Sure, I think yeah. you know. If you if you say this in general respect, not a few, not a lot of people can actually go back that long. But if you really look into this, you know, if you go to China, yeah. some people can go back three hundred generations. And then, of course, you know, our Western European thing is nothing. Um, but what I sense is that usually, if you compare it to America, people find it in America quite amazing. But in Europe, you know, uh, we tend to write down more stuff. Is that right? Well, Holland so specifically, Holland is a country that always kept real good records of, of births and baptisms oh, wow. and burial uh, material. So people people could literally track back to 1600s in their in their sure. lineage. Sure, sure, sure. If you really, I mean, there's a program on Dutch television about your ancestry, and then you know um, they. They usually they ask uh, well-known Dutch people from television, whatever, and they take yeah. the city archive, and then they just do a bit of research, and you, you very easily go back to the 18th century. That's amazing. I mean, 15th century, 14th century, that's a bit hard, but you know, 18th century, that's that's doable. And when you look at the painting of Jan VI the first. Do you like have any association with him? Like, do you actually even consider him a family member, or you just kind of see this painting that you kind of don't have any connection to? Is there like a more I mean, emotional? Sure. I mean, theoretically, and in a way, practically, yeah. But uh, the guy has red hair, and he's dead for four hundred years. So, yeah. Uh, or does he really relate to me? Plus, you also have uh, ten. You know, mother, grandmother, great grandmother, mothers. You know, it's only, it's not always the fathers. And so it, it's it's so much it's such a genetic pool thing that you know does it really look like you? No, probably not. I I probably look a lot like the people from the mother's family of my father. Oh yeah, so, you know, you never know. And did you? And were they all? I mean, because what number are you in the lineage of this now? I'm number eleven. So you're number eleven. Hmm. God, think of it to go back. And in each generation had a male that was a Jan six. Like there's no one generation that didn't have that. Or was there a Yannicka somewhere in there? Uh, as, a a first, yeah. as a first child. As a first child. Yeah. Yeah. My grandfather. He had the elder sister. Oh, okay. Yeah. Your grandfather. And and what was her name? Oh, oh shoot. No, I think Toti. But I'm, I'm okay, not. but but you're telling me that 
that in all the lineage, they everyone had a child, but the first child wasn't always a male, was it? No, 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 no. no. Okay. But everyone had a male in the family yeah. up until your great grandfather, is that right? Or did I, I, I missed that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that in and of itself is already a fascinating thing because the Chalif line, you know, my line, like we had three brothers and none of us had, you know, or one of us had a child, but now she's transgender. So the name won't carry on. Right. Or maybe it will because that. You don't know. Yeah, it's true. It's a very good point. Yeah. Funny. I have a lot more questions, but I'm actually wanting to leave you some space because I uh, know you did research on this one. (laughs) (laughs) Poor him. Poor me. But yeah, like the question that Andy asked, if there's familiar, like if you feel a connection with the painting, like, like, uh, you know, well, no, but I, you know, the, the, I turned it into my job, my profession. So I, I feel I have a stronger connection in a way to Rembrandt. Yeah. In this case, because what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm seeing an image, but I'm actually looking at a object. I'm looking at brushwork and I'm looking at creative solutions. So the connection that I really feel is to understand what he was doing. Mm. And so, sure, if you zoom out, you'll see a figure of a person that once lived and you know you can research the life of that person. But that's not really what I do. I'm not an archivist. I, I am really a paintings expert. So I, I feel a connection with paint mm. and mostly with, well, the, the, the creative, process and mm-hmm. my family had nothing to do with that mm. yeah and I, did, I feel a, a big connection to Rembrandt when you when you say your family had nothing to do with that did that create tension between you and your family no 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 what I mean is that if you sit in front of a painter you just sit you don't mm. really do anything I mean, you can just, you can discuss how you want to sit if you want to be portray- portrayed like this or like that. I mean, but that's sort of what you do. So I have no connection to the image, but mm. I do have a connection to the process behind the image. And so uh, you know, I, I take rem- the whole family out. Mm. It reminds me a little bit when I um when I was raised uh, when I was young, I I really was fascinated with music. And I I heard like uh, Branford uh, Marsalis play the saxophone behind Sting, and then I started to play the saxophone. And I remembered when I when I didn't know anything about the music, it was like a mystery. It was magic. Like I'd listen to it, and I would be taken away with it. And then when I studied it, then all of a sudden I started it started seeing the math, and I started understanding the chords or the rhythm, the progressions, and it, and all of a sudden the magic was gone. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it had a different level of magic, but it was like I saw it in ways that I didn't, I, instead of just experiencing it as I had before. Yeah. And it sounds oh. a bit similar on a lower level than what you're talking think, about. I think, it's, I, I think it's quite similar. I mean, I used to draw and paint a bit, and I, I stopped doing that once I started to really understand more and more about painters and their, and their, their painting process. Um, there is a mystery. And even now there is a mystery, but mostly the mystery lies with the unknown. So when something comes on the market or there, if we, if we would speak about a discovery. If something is there to be discovered, there is, lies the mystery. And because Rembrandt can be so complex and so difficult to really understand, uh, personally, I, I, I can rediscover a Rembrandt, even in a museum, when I stand in front of it, years after I've seen it for the first time, and and really re-understand it. Mm. So first time I went to Russia in the Hermitage and saw all these pictures. It's it incredible. It's incredible, but I didn't really look because it's so overwhelming. I didn't, I was just too young and too inexperienced. And the last time I went, I had grown so much that I felt the mystery was gone, but actually it wasn't because there was so much to see. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that if I would go in the future, I would revisit these pictures again and probably see new stuff again. So in a way, you you can keep the mystery by going deeper into it. Yeah, I think that's another level of mystery. But I, yeah. I saw a beautiful picture by, I think it was uh, John Coltrane, who drew the mathematics of the music 
and it was a sketch that was like it was a piece of art and and you could see the mathematic and then you kind of realize wow the genius is that you start to see it on such a deeper level that you can express it in ways no one would ever imagine yeah right? it was uh, really amazing and, and of course you've got your feelings what you feel because with most art for me personally it, you know it, it's just it's sort of a decoration fancy yeah. decoration or it, Art historical decoration, but you know, with an artist like Rembrandt, it's also emotional. So yeah. sometimes you, it really touches you. And there are certain paintings by his hand that, when I see them, they really touch me. Like the portrait yeah. of Titus, his son, in the Rijksmuseum with a monk's cap. I don't know if you know the picture, but that, that's every time when I see that picture, it you know, it hits me. Yeah. And we have a, a comment coming in from Neil Woodcock, who says the meaning of a piece of art is created at the moment you view it, which is yeah. very beautifully stated. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. also a painter. Yeah, he's also so nice. a painter. Um, yeah. I have to go down this path. I, I had, you know, as w in preparing for this talk, I was thinking, what are the, the emotions or things that come up for me that I'm really curious about? And one of the things, you know, I, I think you may have read the book as well, the Malcolm Gold, Goldwell book, Blink. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, there's that famous story from, I think it was the Getty Museum and the Venus de Mayo. Yeah. I think that was the, the story in it where basically within a second, the the viewer already knew it was not a, a not a real piece. Yeah. So in, in, to some degree, you went through a similar experience, I imagine, in having seen the Rembrandt. Yeah. And so when yeah. was the moment, was it like in the in the book or when was the moment you said, bang, oh, wow, I see something here that. Well, it's, it's quite similar. The, th the thing is in the, in the Malcolm Gladwell book, in the story related to the, the, the Greek idol, the curator of the Getty sensed it wasn't right. Yeah. So he felt it was wrong. And I had slightly different experience. I felt it was right because it was presented as not being right. So uh -huh. it's slightly, slightly different because when you, when you sense something is wrong, uh, you've got this sort of idea. It's 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 too good to be true. Yeah. So it's got to be wrong, and he felt it was wrong. And years later, because research techniques changed, he actually got it right. The the the, the idol that they tried to buy was a fake. But in oh, yeah. this case, it was the other way around because not only the auction house presented it not as a Rembrandt, but I had to prove a gut feeling that it actually was right. Yeah. You see, so that, that makes it different because you literally feel I must be crazy, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. because your big auction house says it's not what I think it is. And how do I... How do, yeah, how do you go against them? Because in uh, essence, they're liable. I mean, they they actually uh, that, and you and you being not, right. That is yeah. But just if you know, it's you've got this Dutch saying, freely translated, that um, uh, uh, king one eye. Uh, you know, he 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 rules in the land of the blind. Yeah, the, the land of the blind, and and so you you see something, and you don't want to be seen or regarded as the guy that thinks he sees it while we're all blind yeah mm. but the thing is it has less to do with i what, what i see or what i think than it has to do with the object because in the end the truth lies in the object it doesn't lie with me or it doesn't lie with anybody else it really lies with the object the objects never lie they're just so what they are. In, in this case, let's say, for instance, if you had you did purchase it and then you had to prove afterwards it was for the price that you purchased it for. W were there any other people that were already inclined to believe it? Maybe. Or were you really buying a piece where no one thought it might work? I didn't buy it. An investor bought it. Yeah. I, okay. I advised that party. Um, uh, no, I don't think so, because in the end of the day, if that was the case. You know, this is such an explosive name. There would have been, you know, herds of bidders in the auction, and there sure. simply weren't. So, no, I don't think so. I, I think that in the end, you actually see this in the documentary that even the, the great professor at that moment, Rembrandt scholar Mr. Van der Weyte, when he first saw it in real life, he slightly doubted it because he 
you know, he had this problem, like Malcolm Gladwell explained in his book Blink, that it was too good to be true. He just couldn't get his head around it. And it took him a long time to really understand what he was looking at. And dur during that whole process, I started writing something which became a booklet. And Van der Eating kindly wrote the, um, the uh, introduction little note. And he stated that he sees or he saw me as somebody with a, a great uh, level of intuition. Which when he wrote it, I thought, really? But then I started thinking about it over the months and years now. And maybe that is true. Maybe I have a certain sense, certain intuition for art that works in a blink. Whereas a lot of people tend to take a lot of time because most of the time they just don't know what they're looking at. And then yeah. they figure out what they're looking at. But if you really know what you're looking at, because this is your daily cost, you really, you know, you go through the books, you look at the pictures, you, you really are obsessed. It becomes a language. Yeah. And it's, it's not difficult anymore. I think you told me this once and I had a fascinating experience because as you started to explain to me how you see things, I started to kind of to kind of nurture that part of my own feeling of how do I see things. So now when I go to an art museum, there's times I'll see things that I'm more aware, like I wasn't been aware that I knew who that was on the yeah. level that it feels intuitive. I think I even sent you a picture when I was in Indiana. Yeah, yeah. A picture at the Vesta Kirk that was like done by the same artist that's in the house, actually. I believe it was the same artist that's in your, um, you know, in the in the sixth house. Yeah. And I was like, wow. I know that I know who that painter is. It was the freakiest, uh, you know, like to see because, and you would have seen it as a child. Like you would have yeah. seen it over and over again. But it's also like with music. I wasn't brought up with music. It was always quite silent in, in, in our house because my mm. parents didn't really like music. Um, so I don't really have a feel for, or I didn't have a feel for it. Now, after, you know, I started living on my own and, there's always music. I really love music, but I really, I really don't get it at the level of a professional musician. And I've got some friends that play instruments. And when they explain a piece or when they perform and they stop and they tell me what they're doing, uh -huh. you start to get it better. Yeah. It's a bit like a, math a mathematician that writes down an, an equation. Yeah. It feels very simple but you really need that person to explain it. And yeah. over time, when you look for yourself and you dare to look, then you start to see it. Yeah, I think I've often seen it, and, and I explain it when I'm talking about understanding a subject, is that the level of distinctions that you have creates the nuance at which you can actually observe or understand yeah. something. So if you're like the Eskimo, he's got a hundred words for snow, right? Yeah. And, the, and we have the one. So in some ways I imagine it's not all that dissimilar for any discipline that one for exactly. me for me it was you know funny if i think about it i've discussed it a lot on the show is that my dad was verbally abusive right as a kid so i had to see every single facial expression and i knew immediately that meant this emotion was going to come in a second like it was like so i got these micro expressions so people go for trainings to say how do how do you people going to react and i'm like oh my god i can already i know it in my bones because i've seen it a hundred times yeah. before as a kid yeah. Especially, you were you were really trained. Yeah, I was really trained. Yeah, yeah, yeah and it, it really sounds like from the moment you saw the image of this painting, sure. Until until now, it it hasn't been like like an exciting journey, or it was exciting, but there was a lot of stress there. Sure, sure, but that's you know with, with major discoveries, and especially when it's really out of thin air, you will always have this this. Um, double reaction you've got people that that really like it and they you know they love adventures and they love a positive uh, the positive side of all of it but you also have the skeptics you've got the as we would say now in, in well, i would call that 80 percent of the netherlands so i would call it you got the haters you got the people <laughs> that don't want you the haters, to yeah. be happy yeah. or to to win or whatever and the thing is for me, I really tried in the, in the last uh, two years to, to focus on the painting. Mm -hmm. Because if you take a helicopter view of all of it, it's all about a painting. It's a bit about Rembrandt, but it's really about a painting. And 
literally in the last on the last bit it's about me yeah but the media and the world outside changed it completely because people can't they can't uh position themselves towards rembrandt or towards the picture but they can position themselves towards you because you're a human being and you're alive and you are easy yeah. to access. Hey, you're the person that they can actually project yeah. upon and create a story yeah. out of so, yeah. What, when they see that picture, they immediately think, why didn't I discover it? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have yeah. anything to do with me. <laughs> with Rembrandt. And that's so silly because, in my view, the picture is actually quite beautiful. And yeah. you know, it's a wonderful extra edition in the oeuvre of Rembrandt. And it's it's so much fun because you know, the, the, the whole adventure uh, can really explain what my world is and what we do, etc. In the end, it turned out to be more like a dramatic uh, uh, soci soci sociology project <laughs> instead of what it really is. I was going to say, it almost sounds like a murder mystery because in some ways it's like we already know, we're, we have to now prove that, that in this case, that Rembrandt did it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it's like we gotta get the murder. Like, how do I now go through each it's in the kitchen with a knife in the you know, the whole it's also bizarre, and this is something that I, I almost never talk about, but you know, this is Rembrandt, and of course that's a name that that, that you know it, it reminds it, it's explosive, it's nice and, and uh, you know it's it's immediately a mystery. But in my day to day business, I don't really deal with Rembrandt all the time. Yeah. but I deal with you know a uh, hundred other artists you never hear anything about that but it's the same process because yeah. it is paint on a panel or on a canvas with the same history with the same problems when you want to get to an attribution with yeah. the same research etc for me they are equally important so I'll mm -hmm. see a picture that literally will never ever change the world, uh, and I'm super happy and excited. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody gives a rat's ass, and it doesn't. <laughs> we'll never sell the picture. Or it doesn't matter. Yeah, it feels like a jazz musician who has like yeah. one friend who's so avant-garde that no one wants to listen to him. You're like, this guy's a genius. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, until he dies. Yeah. I have so, a. Uh, so in a way, it feels like you're playing that same, you know hit that the eagles had to play hotel california every yeah. time again and again and actually what you want to talk about are those little super discoveries that make no sense for the rest of the world yeah but are absolutely far more exciting like even when i see you talking about it like yeah. i see this huge smile on you and you're you're really like oh this is exciting yeah. for me if it only had a Rembrandt yeah. name then it would be so much more interesting for everybody else yeah but you have to imagine yeah. young six the building his yeah. his ancestors were i mean yeah. the first yans were painting by rembrandt yeah yeah the first time and, and, that, and that's the that's the crazy part yeah absolutely crazy. yeah it is but it's like uh th that's that's a little momentum and once you understand that i i yeah. tend to go past it and then mm. by the way we have a comment from josina josina was on our show i think Last week, Friday. Last, Friday. Last week, Friday. She's ah. basically a bomb. Uh, what, what would um, we, Amtana. The Amtana who married Ronnie and my. She's married 3,000 couples and she's oh, been on was... TV. So she's quite a well known, you know. And what's really interesting is she, I, I'd say she runs the Rembrandt market on Sundays on Rembrandt Line, right? Oh, oh. So, so she has a, a an interesting question is, is he a painter himself too? And. No. Is he only interested in the masters, the elite, and the expensive, the galleries and the museum stuff, or is he also interested in what's happening now in the arts? So no. what she's really saying is, are you going to come to see her Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> <I love laughs> That's it. the real question here, Jan. Are you going to see this? Promise, I'll, I'll promise I'll come to the market. Very no, nice. Uh, on, on a professional level, of course, I, I'm really interested in old masters simply because I, I feel that I know something about that. So uh. when you do research or when you want to sell a painting, I think you shouldn't bluff. You should know what you're talking about. So uh. that's the professional side. I think most of these pictures are really beautiful too. So that helps. Otherwise, you're busy with stuff that you don't like. But on a private level, I love contemporary art. And uh -huh. um, in my in my own house, there is more modern art than there is old art. Although, you know, it's like a mishmash of all sorts of stuff. 
uh, I tend to to collect or I tend to be interested in in everything that that makes me move. Mm. Um, but that doesn't give you a salary. Yeah, you know. So it, it is really the divide between the professional side of life because you also need to make money and live. And uh, and just to feel and go for that uh, ride. So I am definitely interested in what people are doing nowadays. And mm. um, I do once in a while have a little exhibition in the gallery for very young starting artists that have no way of, of getting out there. And I just hand them the gallery and I say, you know, you just hang your stuff in the gallery and have fun. I won't be really involved because I do feel that if I stand in front of something modern, that I don't know what to say. I can only say you should feel it. Oh yeah, it doesn't really work. Then I'm out of ammunition. It's not your it's not your play box in that sense. But no, you, I, can imagine, I can imagine you can share how it makes you feel though. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and it does sometimes work. And if I buy a contemporary art piece, I usually sell it to myself because you know I, yeah, I, I'm so excited and enthusiastic. And usually those people that are selling it sort of look at me and think, oh, you know, I don't have to do anything because he's going for it. Uh -huh. but, um, no, I, uh, it's dual because on the other hand, sometimes the explanations of modern art are so woolly and vague and multi-interpretational that I have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. And it sometimes kills the, the feeling I have when I see something. So at one time I was at the Contemporary Art Fair at the Rai, the conference center in Amsterdam, yeah. and I walked into a booth and there was a wonderful uh, photograph of the New York skyline with you know, a crane lying over a pier. And, the crane was painted pink and I, I immediately was drawn to the image and I, I really liked it. So I went to the, the, the gallerist and I said, uh, you know, is it still uh, available? And he said, yes. I said, I, I really think I like it. I, I might be willing to buy it. And then the, the gallerist said, well, hang on, I'm going to get the, the um, artist. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I, I'm not sure I want that. But he got the artist, which was a friendly man, but he explained the, the art piece in a way that I felt, oh, but no. <laughs> you just killed it. It was like whatever I loved into so this dog. So I said to him, no, no, no it's fine. I'll, I'll read your book. It's <sighs> fine. You're, you're very busy and, you know, it's fine. And he sort of stopped his, his explanation. I oh. did buy the photograph in the end, mm. but I sensed it is very important that you, you, you're not always too, um, that, that the piece is not too much explained. So you keep that mystery of what you feel and what you think it is. Oh, I love that you cherish that. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's almost like any time in life when anyone wants to sell you something, it becomes so much less appealing. Like let let it let me have the experience I'm having. Don't tell me the experience also, I'm having. Also, because if people start to put things in perspective and they and they say it is this important or it should be like that or or money wise, if they start talking about money and from that end you start to understand how important something is or how unimportant it is, it mm. completely t takes you away of what you feel. It becomes too um, uh, heady. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it becomes too precise or so, or, or rationalistic, and 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 you're sort of cut off of that energy that the artist used when creating it in yeah. my view. And so, I love to look at things with my own dreamy world, mm, yeah. probably never knowing what really was meant. We have another question from Neil who says, was it scary to stick your neck out and take a chance on a painting being genuine? Uh, yeah, sure. Because not so much financially because it wasn't my money, but the fact that you, you, you stick your neck out and the whole world says you're crazy and it's a small world. The old master world is a small world. That, you know, yeah. Everybody knows everyone. So it's not that you can sort of hide away. Uh, yeah, that was scary. Uh, but not at that time. Okay. 
within the within that moment of doing it, you're so excited and you're just only focusing on on what is happening. But mm -hmm. afterwards, when you look back at everything that happened, you think to yourself, "Holy shit, did I actually do that?" Would you have taken the journey if you'd known what you would have had to go yeah, through? Sure. Absolutely, because yeah. I think that that it all had had a meaning. Yeah, and and if you if you could change everything you've done, you would probably never do anything anymore. Yeah. Because would you, would you uh, let's say for a moment you did purchase it, and then through your own research, you would have found out that it wasn't actually a Rembrandt. How, what would the impact of that been? Was it would it still have been worth what you'd paid for it, and then just be another piece no, of art hanging somewhere? No, it will probably it will probably not be worth a lot of money, but it, oh, okay. would, it would have been a, a great adventure. Yeah. Because I also think that, you know, you learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm, I'm absolutely not claiming that everything I see and touch is, is, is a great masterpiece and, and discovery. Um, it's, it's not a good thing to make a lot of mistakes. No, of course not. <laughs> and then it will stop relating, obviously, ahead of, uh, ahead of the research. So you're very careful, but I think that we all make mistakes, and I think that's good because yeah. it helps you um, grow. Yeah. What, 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 like the way you said mistakes, uh, I felt a bit of a cringe. So because I love mistakes. Ah. So uh, mistakes that I've made. Well, I, I once bought a picture that I, you know, it's not a big mistake, but it's. I thought it was by a Dutch artist called um, Gerard van Honthorst. Who was mm -hmm. a horse painter in the Hague, and I felt it wasn't it wasn't so good it, it, that it, that it might have been genuine, but it certainly should have been a studio picture, and it was you know valued for nothing. And but I just saw it on the image on the internet, and I couldn't really zoom in, and and the colors were clearly afterwards they were clearly off. <laughs> so yeah. you know I bought it for money, and then. It was sent to Amsterdam, and I unpacked it, and I immediately packed it back in the box, and I put it to a local auction house, and made it use loss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> good because it taught it taught me, you know, don't be too certain of yourself. Yeah. Do Do you have a painting of yourself? Yeah, not made by myself, but a friend. No, no a friend made it of me. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Uh, yeah, it was a big project, and it took about a year. And uh, I learned a lot mm. because every painting, especially portraits, are effectively only finished because the artist stops. But what you're looking at is a phase in a project or a phase in a, you know, in a longer phase. Mm. It's a momentum. And I never looked at a picture like that. I always felt that everything was finished, but nothing is finished. It's just... Mm. It's just a momentum of what could have been or where it comes from. And to see something grow and expand and turn into something different over and over. And I finally seeing, in this case, my friend Urban to say, I'm done. I'm going to sign it and I'm done. was spectacular. Yeah. yeah. I've got something to discuss with you that's kind of serious on oh. serious how does it feel to have this plastered like all over the city? Oh, put it away. Put it like, away. How does it feel like Jesus? Put it away. Put it away. Put and it I have to, I have to say something. Like oh, I didn't realize that you have a very prominent nose. Like <laughs> in this photo, like I was like I was like I'd never seen you in like that profile before. But... I will, I'll never look on profile to you again. <laughs> 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 how does it feel i mean it was kind of weird for me because i mean i just know you as you and i'm yeah. walking down the street I and there's like <laughs> there's massive posters of you all over the city right yeah. for a movie that just let's get clear was supposed to come out after the corona so basically you're just being published without even the film behind it at this moment which is kind of wild in yeah, its own you right it. you can see it online you can you can oh, yeah it is from pate at home uh it's weird. Of course, it's weird. But again, it's stranger in the eyes of others. Did so, anyone ever take a picture like me where I stood across from you and acted like we were actually yeah, talking? Yeah, or was yeah. that? All the people did that. And they all thought they were very creative. Original. 
<laughs> I'm sure, but he was so proud of that. <laughs> this, uh, Ron, you should have seen how embarrassed Ronnie was. She said, "Andy, stop! No, get this picture. You got to get this picture." You know what? Stop it. <laughs> uh, Ian, like you were born into this family, right? And there's a heritage there. Yeah. And from what I've read, it, you actually saw the name as a bit of a burden. Sure. Sure. If if you closed your eyes though in those times and you were like, wow, I see myself like if I could do anything in my life, that's what I would want to do. What what would that be if you look back from the eyes of a teenager? Uh, in hindsight, now probably what I'm doing now because there is a lot of passion for this work. Hmm. But I do feel that you're always slightly steered in the direction because of all the experience you have in your childhood. Mm -hmm. The other great passion I always had was movies. So I, there was a brief moment when I really wanted to become a movie director. And I am still a great, great, huge fan of uh, Stanley Kubrick. Bravo. So, oh, yeah, I just watched it the other night. So Which one? I, I, the 2001. I, I read and viewed and like uh, my passion for Rembrandt, I had a big passion for Kubrick, and I decided that's that's what I want to do. But mm. I didn't, I didn't pursue. Unfortunately, so, but I mean that leads to our next question from Neil Woodcock, which <laughs> is: so if you've discovered a Rembrandt, what's next? Uh, within my field, I would say what's next. Because you just opened up the possibility of maybe becoming a director and living the, your childhood dream exactly. again. You know, uh, I don't know. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe, yeah, you just should follow your passion and your heart. And, and maybe I should tick the box and then move on to movies. I, I'm not sure if people are waiting for my movies, but maybe I'm really waiting for my mm. homemade movie. And maybe yeah. that's. That's well, thing. I mean, this movie, it looks like, for just from the looks of it, it certainly was done well. Well, I, didn't, I just, I just talked. Yeah, but I mean, in some ways, you got to, like, get in, like, enough exposure, people know you exist, and then all of a sudden, sure. people might but, get more interested. Uh, yeah, but what I would really like to do is, is get behind the camera and, and nice. create something. I, you know, I'm, I don't really see myself as an actor or, you know, I presented something, but on television but that was all done uh improvised and then so, it's fine so to people out there that are looking to have a film made jan six would be interested <laughs> in directing it are there genres you wouldn't no, do no no i would really want to make my own movie <laughs> so that so give me the money to make the movie i want to make is what you're saying yeah, or, what yeah. would that movie be that's curious what would that movie be uh well it would be a low budget Okay. Uh, movie with probably only two actors, a very long dialogue, and something that really makes you uh, think again about certain elements in life. Wow. I think you should hire Andy to be one of the actors. I even can see the movie in front of me. It would be like, <laughs> it would be a painting. And in the painting, the two people who we've, we've interpreted for years all Sorry. of a sudden come to life and they have the discussion hey, hey, that we've always don't imagined. impose on his on, <laughs> on his vision i'll be the producer <laughs> you pay for it that's fine <laughs> i love it um i have uh, we have neil also said something wrote something earlier to a statement he said i find the hardest point of painting is knowing when to stop exactly yeah i think all artists have that yeah yeah uh, and i think that neil will probably agree that there's always that moment when you feel that you just went too far. Oh, really? Yeah. And you think, oh, I should have stopped a bit sooner. Mm -hmm. That makes that, that sort of, that part is the hardest part. It's like buying a share in a company. Like, when do you sell it, you know? Yeah, or letting go. When you yeah. start letting stuff go, it becomes better. Like, mm. I have a confession to make. Yeah. Um, the other reason I... Learn, sat down to learn about you is because in general i'm not really interested in people's stories or backgrounds i really don't care mm. yeah. and and just sitting here though and getting to know you it, i'm i'm like excited <laughs> <laughs> but i think your 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 initial approach is, is much nicer yeah well the consequence is i just sit here saying nothing 
So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just looks like I'm part of the backdrop. <laughs> yes. Until I really feel ah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. No, I understand. I understand. Yeah. But sometimes when you do research, you you uh, you find too much. Yeah, exactly. You're and too much in a certain direction, and it's very difficult to get the image out of your mind. Um, although mm -hmm. in this case, I think you did wonderful research. He did. Thank you. I'm very proud of you. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had two other things that hit me that I was curious about. Well, I, I was thinking since he's a kind of celebrity, when you go to the supermarket, do people ask you for your autograph? Yeah. Have you ever been asked for your autograph? Have you luckily, ever been asked? Luckily, they never do because I really don't think I'm a celebrity. Um, but what happened is I wear glasses to, mm -hmm. to drive the car. So if I don't wear them like now, I actually don't really see that far. So, uh, you know, further than about five to seven meters, it becomes a bit blurry. Mm. So I, I generally don't see it when people look at me. Oh. Apparently, sometimes people do look at me, but they, <laughs> they, they don't come up to me for a signature, but they sort of gaze at me and then they walk off, uh -huh. think, is it really him? And they come back and gaze again. And I don't see that. And, uh -huh. you know, my girlfriend or other friends have witnessed that and they see it. And then I'm aware that it actually happens. But I, for me, you know, nothing. So I think it's just the profile of your nose they're looking at. You're not going to hear the end of that. <laughs> like, it, it almost feels like when they come to look at you, you don't acknowledge them. You might come across as a, a dick. Yeah, you could be. Cause yeah, probably, yeah, they're not sure, absolutely. But, you know, in the end, that, that is because you don't wear glasses. Yeah. And so I've I've had that, you know, that I'm cycling through town on my bicycle and people wave at me and I have no idea who it was. Uh, and then, you know, the person will call me and say, but well, you, you didn't really, you we're not really enthusiastic. And then I say, oh, it was you. So, so I'm so sorry. <laughs> but, you know, that, you, that's what happens. Yeah. Put on those glasses so you don't offend the world. I <laughs> can't. You know, you know, I, my problem with glasses is that once I put them on, because I don't need them all the time, yeah. I can't find them anymore. So I'm sometimes yeah. looking for my glasses and they're on my nose. Welcome to my world. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, one thing I remembered from two years ago is there was the book of your family that came out. And I remember a discussion we had where a woman in front of you had like bought eight copies of them yeah. for Christmas. And like, I was so frustrated that you didn't say, let me sign each copy of the book. Uh, just explain the story. You know, I was in a bookshop for Christmas, uh -huh. a book myself. And then that, that lovely lady was standing in front of me in the queue and she she paid for nine copies of that or eight copies of that book and she started talking to the the, the salesperson behind the counter who said wow you really you know you're really a big fan and he said yeah yes for all my family members because i think it's such a wonderful book and i i literally didn't dare to tap her on the shoulder and say would you like another gift shall i sign them for you yeah because I was just very scared and I didn't feel that I should intrude in somebody's life. Plus, I, I also loved the fact that that happens and I became a little witness for semi yeah. and I walked away again. Mm. Yeah, I just would love for you to be as, as, as living as absurd a life. I remember, like, I'll give you an example of what I'll do. Like, if I'm on the streets of Amsterdam and someone will say, like, can I take a pic? Can you take a picture for us? So then, like, I'll be with Ronnie, usually, of course. And I say, sure. And then I go and I'll pose with the other person who's going to take a picture of me with the other. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I've, I've been known to do that. It just, it's just, there's a joy in loving it that I just want to welcome in your life, if I may. If I can influence you there. That'd be... Like, like my, my brain, and I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this question right, but have you fully embraced who you are? Like, with everything I attached to that? I think that's a very good question and i am very certain that i haven't yet fully mm -hmm. and i really feel that it, that is a big journey that you know every step you make in life uh, leads you to a new direction and if you open up and, and and you really want to learn you know you're not there yet mm. so no I, I i think i know parts of myself and I know parts that I don't want to know because I'm probably scared for them. Mm. But I would never say that I fully know myself. I, I, I am not there yet. Mm. No. That's a you good would... question. 
Huh? Andy, you take note. <laughs> Listen, if I let him do the interview, you'd be in tears by now. So I'll let him continue. <laughs> uh, I've, been, I've been known for being, in, I'm, I've been labeled intense. You're intense. Yeah. I don't know. I think you're both very sweet. Yeah, thank you. So, mm. Andy's favorite question is that we have five minutes. Is there anything we haven't covered yet? Yeah, that you'd like to share. Uh, that you haven't covered yet. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't or know. I mean, any parts of yourself that you want to reveal to the world? Reveal. Uh, yeah, you want to come out and share something that no one else knows about you at this moment? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, or personally, uh, I like personally. Yes. Personally, what's something that no one knows about Jan Six the Eleventh? Uh, he eats peanut butter uh, out of a jar at yeah. eleven p.m. at night. No, I don't do that. Uh, what does nobody? Uh, no, the thing is, that I'm quite an open book. Mm -hmm. you know, people ask me a question; uh, an answer will will quickly follow. I think. Uh, I think the question you asked, do you really know yourself? What I'm learning is that I have to be probably a little bit more cautious and think instead of answer too quickly. Mm -hmm. So maybe I should think about this question and yeah. come back on that. I think the so, question would be, what is yourself even to begin with, right? Well, yeah. yeah. That's the other thing. Yeah. Uh, but no, I you know I'm not I am not a dark horse. I don't have any crazy hobbies or fetishes. Uh, my favorite color is very simply blue. <laughs> I love traveling and cooking. So there, there are no great great things on a professional level. Yes, there are always new discoveries, and I am certain that more things will follow in the future because that's simply what I love to do. And yeah. if you're obsessed with something, it's bound to happen that that new stuff will come up. Mm. So, yeah. That's the future. Yeah. What I what I, I can say in the last the moments of appreciation for you is that um, since we've had our contact through the years, uh, you've really influenced the way I see and I pay attention to art. Mm -hmm. And um, even to the point that I'll often get <clears throat> irritated because I'll like when I see, for instance, a Rembrandt that's being overly lit. And when I say overly, there's a judgment there, but not lit with the light that would have existed when he had painted it, yeah. then I, I noticed that the, the colors are gonna be flushed out in a way that like the, the light or the candlelight will just capture it as yeah. if it's alive in front of you. And, yeah. um, and now it's almost like you can't go back. Once you see how it could and should potentially look, then you don't, you can't, it's not, it, it's, you're not experiencing a painting, you're just like looking at it or something. There's some mm. big difference. Exactly. And, and, uh, and that's been a beautiful experience that I've, uh, I've, uh, I've noticed since we had our contact together. That's nice. Let's yeah. Keep, let's keep on doing that. Yeah, I'll influence you to become, you know, like more comfortable with the, what do you call it, the tasteless pain. stuff. You know. or, 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 or embracing the pain. Yeah, embracing the pain. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's certainly an area that I know well, of course. If, if you would write a last letter to someone, I mean, you know the story, right? Yes, of course. Who would you write it to? Uh, uh, <laughs> so, so many people. <laughs> I, I, in the end, I, I probably wouldn't write it to one person. Mm -hmm. um, it is. It, it, will it be the letter that 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 sort of saves my my gut feeling, or will it be the letter that shows the appreciation for life? Mm. Uh, if it's the latter, it will be to my girlfriend. Mm. Former, it will be to my father. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Sure. We uh, we have a minute left, so. Oh, I want to I want to offer to photograph you, mm -hmm. but but not not the celebrity. I, I want the person. Mm. No, of course, no, but there is no celebrity. Yeah. <laughs> Keep yeah, but you, not the idea. No, no. Yeah. yeah. Not the Concept, but the real thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's that's fine. But not via Zoom or via. No, 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 no. no. You you'll have to get. We'll get you naked and we'll do it all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you for joining. It Boy. was great having the hour. It was really really fun.
and uh, and we'll, uh, we'll we see Josina is giving us applause from the Rembrandt Square. So when you see her, she'll certainly give you applause then when you visit. Yeah, and post and to... I'll give her a big hug. Yes. You're not married, right? No. I okay. highly recommend her to be your Amtena. Yeah. Like it, seriously. Uh, She's an institution. Tell, I will tell my girlfriend. Great. Yes, don't tell her though, because then she might ask to get married too soon. We want to <laughs> want to keep keep you a single man for as long as we can. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's well, for having for being yeah. with us. Yeah. Thank you. And uh yeah, we 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 speak, yeah. Absolutely. Thank okay. you. Bye. Ah, that was fun. Yeah. Wow. It's uh it's always fun to sort of like play in these different playgrounds. You know, we get a chance to kind of jump in so many different areas. It's uh every day it feels new and different. Yeah. So this is another fun day. And uh tomorrow we have uh Iris. We have Iris. We're going to discuss uh we're going to discuss what do we have to oh, overcoming insecurity. Overcoming insecurity. And then on Thursday we have Steve McCurdy, a 70-year-old who fell in love and drove halfway across the USA to like dropped his whole life to have uh, uh, just to follow love. I, I, I said, you're on the show, and he was really nervous to discuss it, which <laughs> I thought was fantastic. On Friday, we have Niels Elzinga. Zinga. Yeah, Elzinga. He just recently came out with a book. You'll see his face actually published throughout the whole of Amsterdam as well. Yeah. Um, Balkan Blues, about a journey he took with his dad to Croatia. So we're going to discuss three more great shows this week. Thank you all for joining us, and have a very, very nice day. Bye-bye. Bye.